Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I've been a police officer for over 15 years and I thought I had seen it all. But that was before I moved into my new neighborhood and met my neighbor Karen. My wife Sarah and I were so excited to buy our first home together. It was a beautiful two-story house with a big backyard, perfect for us and our dog Rex. The neighborhood seemed idyllic too, quiet streets lined with charming homes. Our real estate agent raved about what a friendly, welcoming community it was. On moving day, I met Karen for the first time when she came over to introduce herself. Right away I got weird vibes from her. She seemed almost too friendly, with an overly saccharine tone to her voice. Well, hi there, new neighbor. I'm Karen from next door. Welcome to the community. I politely introduced Sarah and myself. Karen peered around us, scoping out the inside of our home. What a lovely little place you've got. Much smaller than mine, of course, but I'm sure it will suit your needs, she said in a condescending way. I noticed she kept glancing at my police uniform that I still had on from work. So what is it you do exactly? Karen asked. I'm a police officer, I replied. But today is my last shift. I'll be transferring to a precinct closer to home now. How nice for you, Karen said a little too eagerly. It must be so fulfilling to help keep our neighborhood safe. Something about her tone seemed ingenuine, but I brushed it off. She probably just wanted to get on the good side of the cop next door. In the following days and weeks, Karen kept showing up unannounced, sometimes even just letting herself right into our house. She would pretend to drop by for neighborly reasons like just wanting to say hi or bringing over baked goods. But I could tell Karen had an ulterior motive for her frequent visits. One day, about a month after we moved in, Karen came over in a huff. I need you to give me your house, she demanded point blank. I stared at her, convinced I had misheard. I'm sorry, what? It's simple. I want you to move out and give me ownership of this house. Tomorrow, preferably, Karen said impatiently. I actually laughed out loud, thinking this had to be a joke. But Karen's stony expression told me she was dead serious. Karen, that's absolutely ridiculous. This is our home. Why on earth would we just give it to you? Because, she snapped, it has everything I want and more space than mine. Don't be so selfish, you should share. I tried to reason with her. Even if we wanted to, we legally can't just sign over our house to someone else just because they asked. You need to make an offer and go through the proper real estate channels if you want to buy a home. But Karen refused to see logic. She insisted that as a police officer, I had a duty to help improve her living situation. I should willingly surrender my house to her since she clearly deserved it more. No matter how calmly I tried explaining why her request made zero sense and would never happen, Karen grew increasingly irritated. Finally, she shouted, I've had enough of your useless blabbering. Just give me the damn house or you'll regret it. Then before I could react, Karen hauled off and slapped me square across the face. I saw Red for a brief moment, barely containing the urge to shove Karen off my property. But I took a deep breath and slowly pulled out my phone. Karen, you just assaulted a police officer. That's a felony offense. I said as steadily as I could, dialing 911. The color drained from Karen's face. She backpedaled, stuttering out a series of excuses about how she was the real victim here. I kept my cool and simply stated, You unlawfully trespassed on private property and physically struck me. That means you're under arrest for assault. Karen tried bolting for the door, but I easily caught her wrist and put her in cuffs. She kicked and screamed the whole way as I led her to the patrol car that arrived minutes later. At the station, Karen kept up her tirade, insisting she had done nothing wrong, and that I should be the one arrested for refusing to hand over my house. Ma'am, threatening bodily harm and attempting to coerce someone into surrendering their home is highly illegal, the processing officer told her bluntly. Finally, the reality seemed to sink in for Karen. The system she tried manipulating had flipped right back on her. Karen was charged with assaulting an officer and attempting felony extortion. She was barred from any contact with me or my wife as a condition of her bail. We ended up getting a restraining order, too, just to be safe. The courts mandated Karen to undergo a thorough psychiatric evaluation. She was diagnosed as having narcissistic personality disorder, which explained her delusions that she was entitled to our property at any cost. Last I heard, Karen is still awaiting trial. 
but she is no longer my concern, nor is she welcome anywhere near my house ever again. Sarah and I are just glad to finally have a peaceful home where the neighbor isn't a literal criminal. I never would have imagined dealing with a bona fide Karen as a cop, let alone living right next door to one. But this whole ordeal just reminds me how crucial it is to report assault and unlawful demands, no matter the circumstances. After all, justice doesn't take vacations, even for outrageous neighbors. The next one is a pro-revenge story. This happened last night. I am now in a good enough spot to actually post this. I'm not quite sure if it qualifies as pro, but it definitely isn't petty. I am a professional driver. As such, on the roads in the U.S., there are different truck stops throughout the country that have a pay-to-park system, usually about 10-20% of the lot marked off as reserved, with each space running from $15-$25. The truck stop where this took place had parking for $17, which is relatively cheap for a guaranteed spot. The spots are reserved for 24 hours, starting at 4 p.m. local time, and extending to 3 p.m. the following afternoon. I knew that I would have a late-night delivery, so I came to the truck stop around 3.30 and paid for a reserve spot. I told the manager on duty that I had a delivery up the road that night and would be back once the delivery was completed, but should still be able to clear out the spot by the next afternoon, today. She told me that this was okay, and she would mark the spot as sold when I left. That way, if someone else comes in trying to reserve that spot, she could consult her notes and deny the sale. 11.15 p.m. rolls around, I take off for my delivery. I don't get out of that facility until 2.30 a.m. the next morning, this morning. So I groggily drive back to the truck stop to reclaim my paid-for spot, only to find that the reserved parking spaces are all full. I call the manager on duty and, after giving her my info, inform her that all the spots are full and that someone has parked in a spot and hasn't paid for it. She sends her other employee out to start checking trucks. The culprit was from a company that is known for their bright orange trailers, and he was a company driver. The other employee starts banging on his door to inform him that he is parked illegally and he has to move. Meanwhile, I can see the commotion from my mirror, with my vantage point in the fuel island, where I had been instructed to temporarily park. The driver answers the door with a bottle of Heineken in one hand and some sort of smoking implement in another. I know what it is, but for the sake of the mods, I'm not going to say it. I decided to roll down the window to hear the commotion, and I hear the employee tell the driver to either move or he will get the towing company and police involved. This driver is flat-out irate that someone had the audacity to tell him where he can and cannot park, so he slams the door on the employee, threatening him. The employee calls the police and tow company, and the police show up first. I had worked for this company before, so I know their policies, and more importantly, what they can and cannot have in their trucks. Alcoholic beverages are not allowed in the cab. Anything that isn't a cigarette or a cigar and a lighter, also not allowed. The coup de grace, a pew-pew of any kind, absolutely not allowed, and especially not allowed loaded. This driver had all that and some other not-so-legal substances in his cab, so he was hauled away in cuffs. His truck was hauled away on a wrecker. I made a call after the commotion died down to the company safety director and informed them that their rig would be in an impound lot and their driver is going to jail over the not-so-legal stuff he had in his truck. She thanked me and said that he will definitely lose his job, especially over the alcohol and the other not-so-legal stuff. I guess he played the screw-around-and-find-out card, and it bit him in his career. The next one is a petty revenge story. I'm the GM of a largish family-owned company. I've been there for ages and loved my job until recently. The CEO, until six months ago, was the founder of the business and paterfamilias of the extended family. He passed away suddenly, and his granddaughter, Karen, has taken over. It started well, as she is clever, hardworking, and experienced. There was a lot of goodwill, as everyone was very loyal to the old man and wanted to help his granddaughter, but she is also a bully, a drunk, and a vocal misandrist. Our workforce is predominantly male. At a business drinks function, Karen got drunk, loudly denounced our most loyal and biggest 60% of revenue customer, Bob, as pale, stale, and male and then loudly racially abused my wife when she tried to retrieve the situation. This wasn't by any stretch her first meltdown at customers, employees, or their wives. I met Bob the next week, apologized profusely, 
and asked if he'd ever thought of opening his own plant. He had. He and Mrs. Bob had dinner at our place, and we all made plans. In the coming weeks, myself, my leadership colleagues, and our machine operators have quietly signed up to work at the new plant. We've had after-hours meetings, which we codenamed Fight Club, to plan the new business. All very exciting. Here's the revenge bit. We are all on week-to-week employment contracts. Friday last week, we all resigned by email five minutes before clock-out time. Karen was sitting at her desk with email after email rolling in with resignation in the subject line. You could see the blood draining from her face. I almost felt sorry for her. Almost. Then I remembered what she said to my wife. Tomorrow is our last day. We've recruited almost all the remaining employees to the new business. I have a non-compete clause in my contract, so it's a forced three-month holiday for me. On Monday, the lights won't come on, and the motors won't turn at our old plant. It will just be Karen and a pile of raw material with no one to process it. Her business has sufficient equity to recover, but it will be six months by the time she recruits a new team, recommissions the plant, and gets the order book full again. It will take her 18, 24 months to get the business out of the red. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I work three jobs. The hours and days vary. My full-time job is in an office space on a very fancy modern officer with a great company. They have some great amenities on site, too. A full gym, lockers and showers, a full cafeteria, etc. My second job is close to full-time. Depending on other employees' availability, no set schedule, very chaotic and not well run. It's a boutique, just a bus ride from my office, and it's all in a very busy downtown tourist port city by the ocean. The thing is, it's a tourist boutique. It's all city-branded trinkets, shirts, postcards, and gifts. There's really not much that any locals would want, unless buying it for out-of-town family. My third job is a fast food place. I'm often between these two jobs and don't have time to run home between. I carry a gym bag with me with my tiny purse wallet inside, along with clean business professional clothes, gym clothes, and work uniforms to change in and out of extra underwear. It's summer and extremely hot, and our buses don't usually ever have AC. So if there's time, I'll shower at the office, and I have travel-sized shower items. I bring a book for the bus rides, but I don't have a car. I also bring lunch and snacks, a hairbrush. Apparently, the boutique has experienced a lot of loss, something we had previously brought up being an issue because our boss, the owner, will have big tables and buckets of items outside by the sides of the door where we can't monitor them, especially if we're inside with customers. People definitely take advantage and we've seen a lot of people grab things and just walk off. These aren't the cheaper items in the store either. We've lost an entire display of mid-priced sunglasses, handfuls of bikini separates, and at one point the entire table was emptied in a snatch and run with about five younger people. But he thinks it's us stealing things. His wife runs the store, and she's always in. She said we have a new mandatory bag check, and every employee in the store is a woman who usually carries a purse or bag. It's not just a quick look through the bag. She wants to remove the items and feel around the sides of the bag, and make sure we aren't taking any trinkets and items. I'll be honest, I haven't seen anybody on staff, there are four of us, ever steal anything. And I don't even think it's because they're all stand-up employees. I think it's because they don't care to own any of the cheap, tacky tourist items. Because my bag is bigger, it's been kind of a nightmare for me. She wants me to take every individual item out of my bag and show there's nothing wrapped up inside of it, lay it out across a table by the register. The first day of this I was late to work because she wouldn't start checking my bag until I clocked out, and then she took her time with a customer, causing me to be almost a half hour late to my other job. I considered that I could just continue getting lockers at my office, but they're day use only, so depending on my schedule I'd have to make a separate trip to get back to the office before the building closed to remove my items, and it wouldn't be feasible with my other jobs. I'm honestly pretty sure the staff who cleans the lockers at the end of the day probably wouldn't mind and would work something out for me, but I don't feel like I need to go out of my way to keep a steady rotation on a locker. If my boutique manager wants to make things awkward and difficult on me, I'm going to turn around and do it right back to her. She is a very tightly wound conservative lady, so I added a few extra items to my gym bag. I don't get my period, but I picked up a menstrual cup. Period talk makes her absolutely faint. I included some new reading material, old 70s playboys I keep at the house for aesthetic purposes and I just like them. 
I swapped in some of my sexiest and functionally impossible underwear, but also one of my grannyest of panties. I also, for no reason at all, included condoms, furry handcuffs, a gag gift at my sister's bachelorette party, and I picked up a pamphlet at a nearby community center for their group therapy for bereavement. It went off perfectly at the end of my shift. There were customers in the store, and she made me go through my bag item by item, opening them up and holding them up so she could check to make sure there was nothing hidden. I carefully fanned out my old magazines to show there was nothing between the pages. I pulled out each set of panties like a creepy fashion show, holding them up to the light so she could see directly through the lace. Every item we pulled out of the gym bag made her more and more flush. She was uncomfortable. She could barely perform the check. She nearly had a panic attack when I pulled out a little sandwich baggie with a menstrual cup in it. I even pulled out the pamphlet and set it aside slowly with intent to seem affected by it. And she looked at me quizzically and kind of confused, asked what's this about, and I said solemnly, Oh, I haven't lost anybody, but it's a great place to meet new people. I pulled the condoms out right after saying that. My second bag check was definitely faster than the first, and I was finished and out the door in time to catch my bus and arrive at work early, actually. Speedrunning the bag check wasn't my initial plan, but it was definitely an unconsidered plus to the situation. I honestly don't mind doing a bag check if they really feel like it's so necessary, but the invasiveness of making every employee pull out everything in their bags on a table where every customer in the store has a plain view of everything they have, is a little much, and purposely making it take so much time that it's interfering with our other jobs and personal lives is crossing the line. But now I'm kind of excited to see what other items I can include in my gym bag just to keep her on her toes. I don't want it to be too obvious, but just enough to make her consider that a lady's bag is usually private, and upending that for all our customers to see might not be great for business. The next one is an entitled people story. Some years ago I dated a girl. The relationship was bad. She was very controlling and abusive. It ended really badly and we broke up. I kept going on with my life and after some years I got a decent job enough to solve all my needs, have a comfortable life and make some savings. The thing is, a couple of months after getting my job, my ex contacted me. She first asked me to talk. I believed that she might want to reconnect or something, but she showed up with a five-year-old child, claiming he was my son and demanding child support. I didn't believe her, but the child's age matched the time since we cut contact. I got advice from a lawyer, a friend of mine, to try to solve this out of court. I offered to take responsibility, pay all the costs, and be an active part of the kid's life, but only after making a DNA test. Everyone was okay with this except for my ex. She acted offended and demanded to just give her the money she deserved. She used all the excuses she could and even contacted my family to tell them I was trying to avoid taking responsibility for her child. When she ran out of excuses and the DNA test was finally made, surprise, I'm not the father. She was so mad with the result and cried about the money saying it was unfair and she deserved it. But she didn't accomplish anything. Moving on to last week, there was a little party at my parents' house. My brother, a friend, and I were talking, and my brother started to joke about the situation with my ex. My friend and I started to joke about it, too. Some of our comments were a little dark and bad, but we were far away from the rest of the people, literally on the opposite side of the house, and nobody else could hear us. At least that was what we thought. We were laughing like crazies when my sister appeared, very angry, and pushed me against the wall. She spied on us and heard our conversation, and she was really mad. She started to yell at us about how horrible people we were for mocking a poor woman. A few hours later, when the party ended, she asked me to go to the kitchen with our parents, and she started to say how awful I was for the previous situation. Apparently, my ex had been in contact with her, and she believed her version, and that was her way to have an intervention. My brother and I were like, Are you serious? when she started to say how I forced my ex into being a single mother and that I have the moral obligation to help her. My dad only said that we might have been too cruel making jokes about her, but that I wasn't responsible for that kid. My mom then surprised all of us when she said, even if the kid is not yours, you are making more than enough money to support that child. You should have helped her. Since then, I have been receiving texts. My dad and my brother are on my side, saying I'm not responsible for her, 
but my sister is telling me how horrible I am for ruining their lives. My mom only said, it's your decision and I respect it. I'm just very disappointed that you ended up being so selfish. I'm aware that she doesn't deserve my money and I'm not planning to give her any, but the constant harassment of my sister trying to guilt me is just exhausting. The next one is an entitled parent's story. My mother said this years ago. My brother passed away suddenly from cancer in 2019, 27 hours after being diagnosed. He was 37. It tore our family apart from the grief. It has caused us to make up our living wills and how we'd like to be buried. I was close to my brother, so he told me what he wanted if he died four years before he did. I planned his funeral and everything. My mother trusted me and was pleased with how I planned it. The day after his funeral, we were talking about how we wanted our bodies to be handled after death. I told her I wanted to donate my organs, and whatever is left, I wanted cremated and most of my ashes scattered. If family wanted to keep some, they could. My mother asked how else she would visit my grave. I told her I don't want a grave and again said they can have some of my ashes and plan a funeral if they like. I don't care if I get a funeral or not, personally. Then she told me it's a sin to not have your body intact when going into heaven. When I reminded her I am a non-believer, she started calling me selfish for putting a burden on her by making her think I'm going to hell for my body not being intact. An atheist. And started calling me selfish for not having a grave for her and family to visit. And selfish for not letting family keep all my ashes. When I told her, my body, my choice, my mother started to cry and she said, Well, if you die before me, I'll make sure you have a grave. I don't care what you want. How could you be so self-absorbed? I felt bad and apologized. She said, Think about someone else for once. You know how selfish it is to want to pollute the environment with human remains. Yeah, I know now I said nothing wrong, but at the time, I felt like I was wrong for not letting my family visit my grave, so that's why I apologized. Since then, I wrote a living will because I can't trust my mother to handle my wishes. Recently, when the conversation steered to death and burial, I again repeated my wishes. My mother said, No, you're not. I'm not going to live the rest of my life thinking my daughter is in hell. I'll plan everything for you. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.